Welcome to ongoing general election coverage by Town Meeting Television. This is a one of a series forums we're bringing you in advance of the general election in November. Town Meeting TV hosts forums with all candidates and covers all ballot items you will see on your November ballot. Town Meeting TV election forums introduce you to community decision makers and connect you with issues that shape your local community. If you're watching this live, we welcome your questions on 802-862-3966. And you can watch, watch live uh, on uh, Town Meeting TV on Com Comcast channel 1087 and Burlington Telecom channels 17 and 217, as well as online on youtube.com town meeting tv all right without further ado i will introduce your candidates for tonight and they will then give us their opening statements um on my immediate right i have tiffany bloomley and i also have gabrielle in the middle gabrielle stebbins and then i have uh tom <laughs> lakata <laughs> and i will invite um Tom, to begin with his uh, opening statement, you have a minute. Oh, sure. Um, so why I got involved in this race is because there's kind of an unspoken elephant in the room. Yes. And um, a revolution is defined as a kind of change in government or a substantial change in society or culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going through right now. Um, Black Lives Matter, uh, critical race theory, uh, these are all uh, Marxist in origin. Uh, the founders of Black Lives Matter are on tape acknowledging that. Um, critical race theory uh, was started out in 1989 in a Wisconsin convent. Uh, Richard Delgado and Kimberly Crenshaw are two of the uh, progenitors of critical race theory, and Richard Delgado uh, wrote a book, Critical Race Theory, Introduction, and Introduction, which I read. And he says that he quipped how fun it was that a bunch of Marxists were in an old convent, you know, conjuring up critical race theory. So, and uh, my two opponents here, uh, they're very much um, in line with uh, both critical race theory and Black Lives Matter. And we have to have a really public conversation about that. Uh, it's being taught in our schools now, it's being taught in our government offices. And um, it's really um, a rejection of our principles in both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as well. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, uh, I had you open your statement without reading you what, <laughs> what the, the question uh, would have been. Uh, please tell us why you're running, <laughs> what your experience, the experience you bring to your position, and what will be different, um, and uh, what would you do if um, you uh, get this position. So you've answered it really well. And so I will now invite Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's been a real honor uh, to serve South End of Burlington for the last two years. It's been a unique uh, first term for both Tiff and I, both because everyone in the building knew that we needed to work together to help Vermont through this pandemic, and also because we had just unprecedented federal dollars coming our way. We were able to pass an $8.3 billion balanced transformative budget that did not raise taxes. And if a budget says what you care about in terms of policy, here are some of the things we care about. 138 million in community workforce and economic development to go draw, to grow jobs, 92 million for affordable housing, 215 million for climate initiatives, 50 million for higher ed so that folks can actually rebuild our economy, 96 million for broadband, 114 million for water quality because we do need clean water, 26 million in long overdue increases for community health and social service providers, 40 million for public transportation, and the list goes on. We did so much, but we have so much more to do as a working mom of a five and a 12 year old. I know that we have a real opportunity to take the additional federal dollars coming our way through the inflation reduction act and to make sure that we really address the key issues that i'm hearing from constituents which is making their lives more affordable addressing public safety addressing child care mental health considerations considerations 
um, education, how to change our, our high school with PCBs, uh, economic development, climate change, those are the things I'm hearing my neighbors say they want us to work on. And if you look at our track record, you can take a look at stebbinsforvt.com and you'll see what we've been up to. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And next we have uh, T Tiffany. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a minute. <clears throat> and, th and thanks for the invitation to do this. Um, I, uh, so I jumped in the race after never, having never thought I would go into politics mm -hmm. because we were in the middle of a pandemic and all of a sudden conversations started to change. And they, they changed, uh, we, we started to change the way we thought about who's essential mm -hmm. as a worker, right? Um, we understood childcare really as an economic lever. Um, and not just as, you know, an issue for individual families to, to try to figure out. And, um, and I think we became way more aware than we ever have of just how many people lack um, housing. And so the, your question was about what would change for people in the district. And as Gabrielle mentioned, um, th we, I think we passed an enormous um, number of uh, real pieces of important legis legislation over the last couple of years. And so while in the State House, I think I'm most proud of having helped, you know, pass a pension deal that nobody thought was going to um, be uh, possible. A $1,000 child tax care, um, child tax credit for middle to low income families with children under five, we put $92 million into housing and we passed two critical constitutional amendments. Um, but that's not all you do is sit in, in Montpelier. So, you know, I've worked with 35 um, households to help them get their unemployment insurance checks, to resolve issues with the Department of Labor, to um, uh, find out who was dunning them for the $50 um, because they weren't identified. And then finally, <clears throat> You know, both Gabrielle and I have prioritized maintaining consistent relationships with people in the city council, um, people um, on the school board, so that we're aware of what's happening in our community. Mm -hmm. So this is the work. I've loved it um, and been honored to do it, and I hope I'll have a chance to do it again. Thank you. Uh, the next question is on education, and we'll have Gabrielle answer this question. The legislature can make impacts on how education is funded statewide. Do you see the need for changes to find how we fund education and how would you use your office to move changes forward? So one of the interesting things that I did not know uh, when I actually got in the State House is um, I'm, my day job is as a clean energy expert. Um, for a firm based in Heinsberg that does a lot of national consulting. Um, and so I know a lot about that world, but what you realize when you get in Montpelier is that your constituents come to you with issues and they say, this is critical. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm really proud about uh, is the fact that I had several constituents come to me and say, you need to fix how we have not updated how we wait what it costs to educate our children. We all know it costs more to educate a high school student if you need to have a chemistry lab or you need to be able to uh, teach high level advanced placement mathematics or three different languages compared to like second grade. Um, but we had not updated those weights in 20 years. And so the Burlingtonian uh, representatives and senators and many, many others across the strait, rural communities, you name it, worked together to make sure that we took care of the kids who had not yet for 20 years been getting what they needed. So uh, out of that, there was a lot of discussion about how do we pay for this? The system is way too complex. We have a lot of Vermonters who are land rich and cash poor, uh, and we really need to reassess what that property uh, based approach is. There is a bipartisan study group going on currently. Um, the report's supposed to come out soon, uh, and I will definitely be reading that and looking into that. I do want to note that one of the things I've heard from a lot of neighbors is the concern about PCBs and how to pay for our high school. Um, standing at the polls in August, there was a teacher there who said, I know we need to get our kids out of Macy's, but 
it is so expensive to pay our bills right now. So I am really looking forward to what Tiff said, working with our city councilors, working with our school board, working with other Vermont school systems that are having their schools tested right now for PCBs, and they're finding out that they're gonna have a problem too. So we need to bring back school construction aid and a whole lot of things, and I'm sorry I talked too much. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> You're okay. Um, and I will ask Tom to respond. Sure. Yeah. Uh, right now, primarily, the school funding goes to um, teachers' unions and the administration. It goes to um, teachers, and then it goes to the Progressive Democrat Party. Uh, over 90% of teachers and the unions' money goes to the Democrat Party. It's almost like a syndicate right now. Mm -hmm. And the children are, and the families aren't really, um, um, they're last in line. So my funding solution would be to fund uh, through families and parents and let them decide where their children, what's best for their children. So school choice would be among my top issues and try to get the politics out of education. Okay. Thank you so much. And I will now uh, allow You know, I, we worked in tandem on this, on this question of um, uh, school funding as it relates to um, the waiting. Um, and so Gab I don't have much to add to what Gabrielle said. I guess I want to, your question was about funding. Right. And I think what I'd just like to say is that I think our schools are under tremendous pressures right now. Right. And, and it's, <clears throat> you know, you look at the number of vacancies um, that exist. Mm -hmm. I think COVID has had an um, extraordinary impact on schools. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the pressure on teachers and administrators has been, um, Phenomenal, and I, I'm married to somebody who runs a school, and and um, that is a. Uh, it has been exhausting for everybody. Um, I think that we. Uh, um, there are teachers who are leaving, <clears throat> not just because they are exhausted, though, but because they're afraid for their personal state safety, mm -hmm. given this state's gun laws, and so, uh, given what has happened around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I'm really proud of the work we did to uh, shore up teacher pensions mm -hmm. um, because it is a promise that we made and it is something that everybody could agree to. Um, even the administration um, <clears throat> uh, reps until they didn't. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have you uh, hold on to that because later on we'll be asking you a question about the gun laws. Uh, for right now, I will move on to the third question and I will have you uh, begin by um, its own health care and by answering this, uh, the following question. Um, we know about the increasing uh, cost of health care and what it's putting pressure on the Vermonters and the state-wide uh, economy. And I heard you mention about COVID and you know how it's uh, sharpened our focus on inequities. Um, and what do you think is the next thing for health care to do as far as changes in Vermont, and please uh, be specific. Yeah, well, well, I'm not an expert in healthcare, uh, and yeah. but I have tried desperately to learn as much as I can about it because I think it's one of the most critical issues that we face, and it affects the budget in all kinds of ways. Um, and and the question is, as written, really is about how do we reduce the the burden of healthcare for families and individuals? And so I'll start with my premise that uh, that is that. <clears throat> guaranteeing access to quality health care is one of the primary responsibilities of government. And we've already affirmed this um, in uh, creating Medicare, Medicaid, and Dr. Dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I've had, to st I've had struggled to learn, well, what can we affect in the state versus what is really a federal issue that we can't influence? And so here are a few things that we can do to try to lower costs um, in Vermont. First, we can create, um, we can reduce our reliance on traveling nurses and um, temporary personnel by creating the workforce that we need and the legislature appropriated money to do just that. Um, and we'll need to do more. We gotta start, we gotta start to move away from paying for procedures versus <clears throat> so that because that incentivizes the high cost 
procedures um, and it what it and it disincentivizes primary care you know pediatric care geriatric um, care uh, we're a small state and we don't have to have four hospitals that specialize in you know this kind of surgery or or that kind of um, treatment so we need to incentivize coordination and perhaps even you know asking hospitals to stop doing certain things and then finally we have to enforce we have to enforce some continuity in terms of um, pricing because as the auditor state auditor said you know you can pay either forty two hundred dollars or twenty six hundred dollars or sixteen hundred dollars for an MRI um, depending on where you go and that doesn't make any sense to me this is obviously something that you're very passionate about, but <laughs> we're going to allow to uh, Gabrielle to respond. And remember, you have a minute and a half. <laughs> okay. Um, so building off of what Tiff said, uh, actually for the past five years, we've been really looking at how to reform from what you were talking about procedures, which another word for it is fee-for-service model, to a value-based model in which providers are paid for for the health outcome. And I think we are seeing um, real progress in this area in terms of Act 167, which we passed this past year, uh, to try and keep chipping away at what the challenges are. Unfortunately, we're still just chipping away at it. And in terms of how to, how to address affordability, one of the things that um, viewers should definitely know is that uh, for some of you, if, if you're, um, let me look at my notes, if you're purchasing through Vermont Health Connect or directly through MVP or BC, um, BCPC, or if you're uninsured, uh, ARPA has uh, subsidies based off of your income level to help you pay, uh, to help you reduce your premiums. Um, again, federal support, not a tax increase for us Vermonters and really helpful for folks who are struggling. And the other thing is access that Tiff mentioned. Um, and one of the things that we worked on, going back to economic development, is putting $12.5 million into nursing labs, into trying to really boost more educational opportunities so that we can see a lot more public health uh, providers out there, as well as some changes in telehealth that we allowed for so that more people could get quicker and solid access to healthcare when they need it, rather than waiting, waiting, waiting. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for your <coughs> response. And now uh, I invite Tom. Okay. Thank you. What was the question again? The question is about the increasing cost of healthcare and uh, what it's uh, what the pressure it's putting on the uh, Vermonters and the state uh, economy. And uh, we also talked about COVID and how it's uh, sharpened our focus on inequities in healthcare. And so what do you think is the next thing for healthcare to do? Um, what changes does oh, sure. Vermont, should they uh, mm -hmm. expect to see? So it was um, several, several decades ago, Vermont once had a, a plethora of, of insurance companies. A do they had a dozen, two dozen insurance companies. And then the, I think it might have been under the Howard Dean administration, the Democrats put in all kinds of regulations and now we only have two or three substantial insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And because they're so small, um, essentially they're just administrative agents of the state. Right. And so now we have more or less a state-run healthcare system. Right. And if you would free up the healthcare market, bring in more insurers, bring in more competition, it's well known that competition brings uh, prices down and it will bring quality up. So we need to deregulate the healthcare industry and not make it a monolithic uh, government-run um, healthcare industry. Thank you. Um, and now uh, the next question is uh, about uh, criminal justice reform. And I will have you respond first, and then Gabrielle will follow, and Tiffany. Okay, and remember you have a minute and a half <laughs> because we have a bunch of other questions. I've been pretty good on my time. I've been the one that's been good on time. <laughs> okay, so how does uh, Chittenden County address crime? And is there a problem with policing, policing that needs reform? How would you address uh, community safety? So those yeah. are three questions. Yeah, the problem isn't with the um, police. The problem is with the culture. Uh, the, the community policing was um, more or less um, doing well. And then it was probably the advent of the George, George Floyd right. 
um, murder, followed by Black Lives Matter and Antifa, and, Antifa, and then critical race theory, and the culture shifted. And so then they defunded the police, the progressive Democrats, um, these two young ladies here, uh, were behind that whole movement. And so now we have um, poor police moral, morale, uh, we have a lot less police, uh, prosecutors like the progressive Democrat Sarah George doesn't prosecute them anymore. Most of them are, many of them are not funded by George Soros. And so there's a whole culture shift that has to be uh, turned around. Mm -hmm. And these are all, again, I mentioned revolution in my opening statement, and, and this whole movement is antithetical <coughs> to our constitutional republic, and it needs to be addressed. Thank you so much for your response. And now, uh, it's your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and to viewers, I really encourage you to look at our track record, um, because much of what uh, Tom is saying is inaccurate. Um, so please check out Stebbins for VT, check out our voting records. Um, quite a bit of it is inaccurate. Um, I do want to say it was, I was glad to see the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, um, that their work is working in terms of uh, decertifying um, a, a Williston police officer who had uh, quite a, quite clearly quite a, a long history of issues being uh, rising up. Um, I do want to say also that I've heard from a lot of neighbors that public safety is one of their top concerns right now. There are two things that you do to reduce crime. One is uh, catching the criminal activity immediately, which you can only do if you have enough police officers, uh, and two, making sure that there's a quick process through the courts. And our courts right now are really backed up. We have neither of those. So we do need to continue the work of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but we also very much need to support our public safety providers and enhance the system with mental health providers uh, and address the substance use ch challenges as well as the housing challenges. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I'll offer a, a little bit different um, perspective. So I've been involved in the criminal justice um, system for about 20 years um, at both ends. So Vermont Works for Women trained women to, to go into um, the field of law enforcement, and we also offered training programs for women who are in prison. And so I, my perspective on this is informed by these different experiences. and. Everything that I've read <coughs> that is, um, <coughs> everything that I've read suggests that communities are safer mm -hmm. when there's economic opportunity, when people have access to quality health care, mm -hmm. when there's access to education, <coughs> when public spaces are well maintained. Now, aside from petty theft and property crimes, actually police statistics reflect a consistent downward trend mm -hmm. in the number of violence incidences and in terms of the police activity. But what's gone up are mental health crises requiring police attention. That's, that's doubled since 2012. And the number of drug overdoses, which has gone up 72% over the last two years. So if we feel unsafe, I think it's in part because the social safety net is fraying. And what can we do? <clears throat> we can address those very issues, particularly mental health mm -hmm. um, and substance use. Okay, so they're related. Okay, thank you so much for your response. And now we go to question number five, and it's on the ballot issues. And I will be begin with you, Gabrielle. Uh, to answer this question, and you will, uh, Tom will follow, and you will follow. Um, the question is two constitutional amendments, constitutional proposition two and proposition five, will be in front of the voters this November. Do you support or oppose? I support both of them, and I want to say that there unfortunately have been a lot of erroneous, completely. Um, not factual statements made about, in particular, uh, Proposition 5. The exact word is that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. I do believe each of us should be able to make our own reproductive decisions. 
And uh, with the change at the Supreme Court, this has become even more important. This proposal uh, essentially will maintain the current status quo. Um, we have not, nobody can have an abortion past 21 weeks and six days. It, the process go th goes through an ethics review, and it only occurs if there's a fetal abnormality or if there's a maternal risk. Um, so, so much of what you're hearing, please know it's inaccurate. And with regards to um, proposal two, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a loophole. We need to close a loophole which still allows slavery in Vermont. Thank you so much for your response. And Tom? Yeah, um, Article 22, the Constitutional Amendment, personal reproductive autonomy, what does that mean? It's, it's deceptively vague and it was purposely written as deceptively vague. Um, Gabrielle said um, we should have, um, we should have um, be allowed our reproductive uh, rights. Okay, so what about a man? The, the, the amendment doesn't mention a woman. The amendment doesn't um, mention abortion. So what if a man says, I want that child? Does the court say that the man's reproductive rights surpass that of the woman? That is not what, what the language says. And a man, the, there are the, so many unwanted children that the man the, could definitely adopt one of the thousands of so children. So the man could stop the fosters. woman from having an abortion? The man can work with the woman. Could and the, man the man stop? Can the man stop? That is not what the language says. It doesn't say he can't, though, does it? That is not what the language and says. They, the, you know, it's deceptively vague, and you're kind of admitting it right now. No, and, I'm not. As well, no, uh, I'm not. The the, the uh, uh, personal reproductive autonomy could that mean that you could have human cloning? Could you have a three DNA child? Let's say a gay couple, uh, two men want to have a child, okay, and they have a surrogate mother. And right now the science isn't there. And so one of the men will have the DNA of that child, but what if it's possible in the future uh, to have a three DNA child, the DNA from both of the men and the mother? Is that ethical? Should the people debate that? Uh, this constitutional amendment could supersede democracy. It takes the decision out of the people and it puts it into the courts. And that's why this very deceptive language uh, will never reach the people. It will always be um, a decision of the courts and outside of democracy. Thank you for your response. I will give Gabrielle 30 seconds to, if she has something to say. Uh, if you do not, then we'll move on to Tiffany, please. I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I, I really, I don't, I don't think you're interpreting this language correctly. So I'll leave it at that. I think I'll... Um, I mean, I, you and I agree on this issue, um, that uh, what, what, we're, what we would be putting in the Constitution is in current statute. And the reason we're putting in the Constitution is that Congress right now is debating whether a bill that might limit abortion <clears throat> um, at, fi you know, 15 weeks. And um, uh, that violates at least the principles that are in our own statutes. Um, I fully support both. The constitutional amendment process is really deliberative. It takes five years from the time you start to work on it to getting it approved by two different legislatures. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it um, goes to a public vote. And I feel that the people of Vermont um, will speak to this and I think they'll, they will support both of them. Thank you so well, much, Tiffany. I'd like to respond to that. Uh, Tiff said that the federal law may uh, ban abortions after 15 weeks. And if, if they actually did that, the Supremacy Clause supersedes the Vermont Constitution. So that amendment would not have, uh, would not have premacy over the uh, federal law, number one. And then you said the, um, you <coughs> said the amendment is already, is already a bill. And it's not. That personal reproductive, I mean, oh. Act, is, Act 47 allows unregulated, undetermined abortion right up to nine months, okay? It does. And so this amendment isn't necessary because it's already law 
that you could have an abortion up to nine months, which is uh, a monstrosity. You cannot have an abortion. Yes, up you to could. Nine. No, is, you yes, cannot. you can. You cannot. That is the law, okay, and that's you. what and that's what the <laughs> amendment says. Okay, thank you so much. I obviously this is not something that we can solve tonight, <laughs> and I'd like to be able to cover the questions that we have on hand. Um, so I'm sorry to just. Um, bring you back to the next question, which is actually something I'm very passionate about, and it's about the language access, and I will allow Tiffany to respond first, and then Tom, and then <coughs> Gabrielle. And the question um, is, what is the value to Vermonters in supporting language access to information about health, local government, <laughs> and education issues? Um, yeah, I loved that this question was, was included. Um, it, it, I didn't fully appreciate prior to the pandemic um, how little the state has, had invested really in um, translation, in um, providing language support um, for immigrants who don't speak English as their first language. And the role that the Language Justice Project um, provided in disseminating information about COVID, I thought, I mean, it was remarkable. Um, and it happened so quickly. And, um, and that opened my eyes as a campaigner because I thought, oh no, I need to, I need to find out, well, who, what languages are spoken in our district so that our campaign materials could reflect that. Um, the city of Burlington, 12% of residents um, <clears throat> speak a language other than, than English at home. We've adopted a language access policy as a city. Um, the state needs to follow suit, I think. There were two bills, um, in, um, uh, one in the House, one in the Senate. They didn't get a hearing. There was a lot going on last year. Um, so I am hopeful that, well, I, I plan to be a co-sponsor of a bill to do just that at the state level. Thank you so much. Uh, and who's next? Oh. Okay, Which you, one? Can go, you can go, Gabrielle, you can go. Uh, you know, we, um, we have uh, so, many, so many Vermonters and so many programs um, welcoming uh, refugees to our state um, who are becoming part of the economic fabric of our state from um, migrant farm workers uh, to, you know, some of, the, some of the teachers in my daughter's school who, you know, she goes to school here in Burlington. Um, we can't say, please come, please be part of our community, and then not be able to communicate. And um, we have to decide uh, which way we want it. Do we want uh, a Vermont that is growing, that is economically diverse, um, and that is communicating both ways? Or uh, do we just want to say welcome, but then you're on your own? And I prefer the former. Okay. Thank you so much for your response. And Tom. Okay. I'm not familiar with the term language access, so maybe you could kind of interpret that for me first. Um, what do you mean by language <coughs> access? Uh, perhaps one of you would like to respond. What do you think? Ac <clears throat> well, language access meaning giving people who don't speak English as a first language access to vital records, um, information about health, information about, um, you know, the city government and filing forms, etc. It's not discriminating based on one's first language. Okay. Does that <coughs> answer your question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess okay. it does. Yeah, I would think, firstly, um, I'm, I would think technology could solve a lot of it, right? There's, you could speak into a computer now mm -hmm. and ask it to interpret mm -hmm. that into another language. Mm -hmm. So I think that the technology sh should be there to do it. Okay, thank you for your response. And now we move on to um, the next question. We don't have too much time. Um, we have question seven asking about community access. Um, currently funded primarily by cable customers and uh, revenue for community TV is in decline. How would you see the legislature supporting community access TV such as uh, provides for this forum? So. Uh, do you want to respond, and then Gabrielle, and then Tiffany? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, it's, it's being funded right now through cable, cable revenue, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to look at 
the um, I'd like to know the the viewership of of this sh shows like this, mm -hmm. and see how many people are actually watching it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would start there, and then in conjunction with that, I would look at the budget, mm -hmm. the state budget, and see if um, prioritize uh, uh, things like health care, criminal justice, mm -hmm. um, media, etc., and then make a decision from there. Thank you. Do you have a response? Uh, yeah, I mean, having public uh, opportunities to participate and listen to um, discussions like this is, is critical. Uh, and particularly as more and more people are getting their news from channels that aren't news, like social media, it becomes even more important. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to look at uh, you know, some of what we're seeing. We, we just had $94 million through broadband to look at how we start to develop uh, longer term financial planning. Um, the fact that the FCC voted to you know, basically reduce over time what the cable expenditures would be to uh, community access um, should be reassessed. And how can we re-bolster um, that bigger picture? Understanding also that the digital age and how we communicate is changing. So where, when, when there is change, when there is market change, we're going to see new opportunities for new income streams. And that's one of the areas that I think we need to actually identify. And if, we're, if the FCC isn't going to change their uh, decision, then where are new alternatives coming from the new markets that we're seeing? Okay. Thank you so much. Right, Tiffany? Yeah, I, I, I really, we haven't even talked about this, but I, I, I do agree with you about that. And so <clears throat> my dad had, a, um, there was a community access station in Arizona where we grew up and he was a lawyer and he um, did this thing called Law Talk. And he would present issues that would often be really, um, they, would, they would seem overly complicated to, to people who aren't lawyers. And he would explain certain things. And, and one day we were on the street and uh, somebody came up to him and said, Hey, I gotta thank you for that um, that session on you know contracts and you know there were a couple things that I was able to ask a question and I I avoided a big problem and I said well <laughs> I, I all of a sudden it dawned on me wow TV could serve a public purpose you know I never thought about that because it was entertainment to me mm -hmm. and it, it, this this station and others like it have did that in COVID it, they stepped up and you were the um, you are our source of information right. um, and our way into uh, government meetings that by definition had to be on Zoom. Yeah. Um, and so, I, yeah, we have to figure out the business model. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is uh, citizen uh, legislation. And I'll begin with Tom and then um, you'll finish. All of the questions herein reflects complex system issues. And this year, the legislature will see a big turnover in elected officials. Can a part-time citizen legislature in Montpelier do the job needed for Vermonters? Oh, I think so, yeah. If anything, I would shrink the amount of time our legislators are in office. We don't need to grow government, we need to shrink it. Um, and we need to build out um, the private sector, mm -hmm. okay? And so um, civil society is defined as that space between the individual and government. So civil society comprises um, all the volunteer organizations, churches, civic organizations. And that's the part of our culture and society that we need to grow and we need to shrink the government. Okay. Thank you so much. And Gabrielle, we have four minutes. Uh, well, so we definitely, definitely need to um, maintain all parts of society. If it's, uh, you know, businesses, if it's uh, various civil society, nonprofits. Um, I do think, though, at the core of government is that we are supposed to have a three, uh, three part system of checks and balances. We have the judiciary branch, we have the administrative or the executive branch, and then we have the legislative branch. Right now, Vermont is very off kilter. We have an executive or administrative branch, and it doesn't matter if you're Democratic or Republican, with like 6,000 full-time employees. And then we have a legislature that's in session, volunteer, pretty much, I mean, like no staff, January to mid-May. Um, and, you know, this worked when we were farmers. And 
we all we had to do was milk our cows January to May and there were like eight kids at home and maybe you got one piece of mail by horse like once every six weeks. It doesn't work anymore and which is why you heard me reference all of these studies and these reports. I do think uh, challenges are becoming more and more complex um, and I do think we do need a full-time citizen legislature, not citizen, well, I think we need a full-time legislature and you know, one way we could do that to make sure we're not actually raising taxes is you cut it in half. Right. Uh, I really, I, if, if Vermonters <laughs> want to continue to see the thoughtfulness and the due diligence and to make sure that we actually have a balance of power across the three government branches, um, while also having for-profit businesses involved, non-profit schools, um, then we do need to actually have uh, folks who can do the job and focus full-time. As a working mom, uh, it, is, it is very, very challenging to do this, but we need all voices. And if we want diversity, it, we've got to re reassess the model. Thank you. Um, Tiffany. Well, I was just going to say <clears throat> that diversity... Um, Re I mean, study after study after study has determined that diversity um, in all groups, organizations, is critical to high functioning. You get the best results when you have a diversity of views um, and experiences and from which to draw on. And we're not going to get that in the current form. And we've had a couple of studies come out making recommendations <clears throat> um, that would, I think, help to diversify the legislature economically, racially, um, and experientially. Um, but we haven't, we haven't been able to do anything about it. It's tricky for legislators right. to suggest paying, you know, legislators more or right. giving them health insurance right. or yeah. fill in the blank. Okay. So uh, we have come almost to the close. And I think that it will be a good time for everyone to have a closing statement. And, uh, and then we will be happy to close the session tonight. Really good uh, discussions we had tonight. And uh, let us begin with Tom, with your closing statement. Oh, sure. Yes. So Tiff just mentioned how wonderful diversity is. Um, basically, in Montpelier, you have, you have a monolithic party, a monolithic ideology, the progressive Democrat, and it, it leans heavily socialist. And so if you want diversity, you will not vote for either of these two young ladies, and you'd vote for me. Um, I would pre in a different perspective. Um, I have some private um, sector experience. I have some uh, social service experience. And I view the world very differently if you watch this whole um, in interview debate tonight. I've, I view the world very differently th than uh, these two. And so I would bring diversity and a new kind of thought uh, into Montpelier because right now it's, um, it's really a monolithic um, pool and it's, it's not going to change until you stop uh, voting for the progressive Democrats and bring some uh, common sense back into Montpelier. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle, talk about your priorities when you, <laughs> sure. you get into office and what are you going to do? What's the most important thing for you to do? So Vermont's a small state, uh, 650,000 people or so. We're the size of Boston. We need to be strategic and wise about how we want to grow and how we want to support Vermonters in uh, being able to live in an affordable, gorgeous state uh, and being able to have health care access and child care. We have been <coughs> very, very responsible um, passing uh, balanced budgets without raising taxes. And I, I uh, really encourage you to check the facts and look at my website, look at TIFF's, TIFF's website. And uh, we do have some uh, session reports that you can take a look at um, that show you actually factually what we've been up to. Uh, and I just want to say I currently work, um, you know, for a for-profit. I work in business. I've also taught violin students in underserved schools. I've done human rights research in South Africa. I've worked on water quality. I've been a park ranger. All of this is bringing diversity. Uh, and I think um, I want to say one more thing, which is there have been a few comments about socialism being bad. And the reality is we have roads. We have I-89 because we've all pooled our funds to work together. We have schools because we've pooled our funds. We have Medicare. We have uh, Social Security because we've pooled our funds. So let's remember really when we work together, we do best. Okay. So we have a minute for you. 
I <clears throat> I don't think I need a minute. Oh, I just I, it 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 um <coughs> it, it's been a real privilege to um, better understand how things work in Montpelier. Uh, there is we have robust arguments in our committees and um, on the floor all the time, and there is a diversity of opinions um, in, in Montpelier. Uh, and I certainly don't see our, the Democratic Party as being monolithic. Um, there, is, there are times when we need to come together. The caucus almost always votes 100%. This is, turn. This is my turn, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, uh, I, I hope that you'll give me another two years um, and, um, and, and we'll keep in touch as you have been. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you all for coming in tonight. Thank you, uh, thank you for tuning in to uh, Town Meeting TV, which is the ongoing coverage of statewide and regional candidates and ballot items. You can find this and more, uh, more forums on www.ch17.tv. And don't forget to vote on or before November 8th. Uh, this year, ballots will be mailed to all registered voters in the state. And to confirm you are registered, and we will be receiving a ballot at home. So visit the Secretary of State online portal at mvp.vermont.gov. Thank you so much for watching and sharing Town Meeting TV. And if you're not already, please subscribe <laughs> to our Town Meeting TV YouTube channel. Thank you so much, and have a good night. You guys are clear. Good job. All right. Thank you.